Okay, hello everybody. This is Farah Hatayzar. I'm one of the co-organizer. The pleasure of uh, working with Nikhil and colleagues to make this workshop live. So, uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, Professor Matthew Tavakoli from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Alberta, uh, Canada. Uh, Dr. Tavakoli got his uh, Bachelor of Science uh, from Ferdowsi University, Iran, Master of Science from Kane to see Iran, and uh, he got his PhD from University of Western Ontario in Canada, and he was one of the NSERC postdoc, uh, postdoctoral winners, and uh, he did his postdoc at Harvard University. Uh, right now, he is uh, the uh, director of uh, biorobotics and telerobotics lab at uh, University of Alberta, and he's associate editor of multiple IEEE journals and other journals, including IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters, and IEEE ASME Transactions on Megatronics, um, among many other journals. So uh, please join me, thanking Professor Akoli to start the, the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farouk. Uh, can you hear me okay? We hear you loud and clear, yes. Thank you so much uh, uh, for organizing this uh, interesting workshop and for inviting me and thanks to everyone for being here. So I'm not a <clears throat> developer of uh, augmented reality, I'm just a user of augmented reality and my research is uh, medical robotics. So I'm going to show you some examples of where uh, augmented reality or virtual reality can be used in medical settings for intraoperative guidance. So we're not talking about showing things uh, to a pre-plan to the uh, clinician, for instance, we're talking about helping the clinician see things that they don't normally see and giving them that kind of x-ray vision interoperatively so that they have enhanced situational awareness and they can perform better. So um, the goal is to create medical environments that uh, co-locate haptics or the motor space uh, of the user and the visual space and that these environments should be engaging and intuitive uh, and uh, they result in enhanced situational awareness and performance for, of tasks uh, by users. How can we do this? We can do it if we have augmented reality systems that bridge this spatial disparity between the virtual environment and the physical environment and bring them together and let them coexist uh, uh, in the same location. Uh, so this is different from virtual reality where we want to immerse the user in a fully computer generated environment. We want to actually superimpose that virtual reality environment on, uh, on the physical space and create augmented reality. So there are various technologies that you see here. We uh, opted to use kind of this look through or see through uh, technology that you see in the middle, minus it being a head mounted display because that's what clinicians and patients do not like usually and projection mapping <clears throat> or a spatial augmented reality that you see on the right hand side. So I'm going to talk to you about a few oncological procedures, so cancer related for uh, its biopsy, uh, needle insertion therapy, and mandible reconstruction for cancer, uh, for, for jaw cancer, and also about um, rehabilitation and <clears throat> injury prevention or injury assessment. Uh, so for these, we use different uh, systems uh, that we have developed. Again, very simple systems. The, for oncological procedures and intraoperative guidance, we use this look-through uh, augmented reality system that I'll talk about. And for uh, rehabilitation, we use projection mapping. So starting with the look-through augmented reality, it's a very simple system. Uh, where you have a semi-transparent mirror through which the user can see the physical world, uh, for instance, the body of the patient and the instruments that the surgeon is holding. And at the same time, as co-located with that, the uh, clinician is able to see the reflection of whatever is shown on this TV. So by properly tracking the head of the clinician, in this case, through a connect, and then updating whatever is shown on the TV, you're able to show things on this virtual monitor that are overlaid in the correct location on the patient's body. So we use this for, for biopsy. So biopsy is um, one procedure where uh, even with image guidance, there's quite a bit of false negative and the false negative is because uh, clinicians have a hard time locating things deep inside the tissue and knowing where the needle has gone and where it is relative to the target, for instance, the tumor, when they wanna take a sample. 
So this gives rise to these false negatives. And what we are trying to do is to help them with visualization and localization of the needle uh, versus the target, assuming we know exactly where the target is. So do, to do this, in our study, we built an opaque tissue phantom made out of plastisol and, uh, and embedded in it some non-palpable tumors. So basically some uh, tissue that's built of the same material uh, was, uh, was uh, embedded. And then the goal was to uh, insert a needle and take a sample from that tumor. Uh, there was real-time electromagnetic tracking of the location of the needle and the tumor. This was the assumption. So what you see here is on the left, you see this augmented reality setup uh, through which again, the user is able to see his own hands, the needle, the part that is outside the tissue and the continuation of that needle inside the tissue as well as the target. So basically this is what you would see when you look down that mirror, you see the needle shown by this green line and then the desired direction to reach the target that was also specified by the pink line. And you have to bring the green line to the red line for zero error ideally. And on the right-hand side, we have the regular TV display. So this is basically just virtual reality. You, you can show multiple views to the, uh, to the clinician. And we presented both of these. So we put uh, people through a user study and they performed this task uh, multiple times using each of these systems to be able to compare. We did not see a whole lot of difference. Basically what we found was that AR was non-inferior uh, in terms of outcomes, uh, accuracy and completion time of the task to VR, they were pretty similar, uh, but this was a really simple ta task that the, 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 the object uh, or the target was a static, the needle was not a stiff, and there was no point in showing where the needle was really going. It was a straight line. Um, the tissue was relatively stiff and the target would not move, which would have required more information to be conveyed to the clinician. So, but overall, AR was non-inferior to VR. So we continued working on this. The next thing was needle insertion therapy for prostate cancer. So for prostate cancer, a bunch of needles, as you see here, are inserted into the tissue. These needles are preloaded with radioactive seeds. And once they reach in or in, around the tumor, they are deposited and permanently uh, deposited into the patient's body to be able to kill the cancer over time. So key to the success of this operation is accurate placement of these seeds in pre-planned locations that come from pre-operative images. Now, the issue is that these needles for steering, they are made with a bevel tip. Because they have a be bevel tip, they bend as they are inserted into tissue. And also as they go into the tissue, the tissue deforms and the target moves. Therefore, it's a very difficult uh, task for the surgeon to be able to accurately steer the needles toward desired locations deep inside tissue. Even expert surgeons have about five millimeter of error on average, which is quite big compared to the 50 millimeter diameter of the prostate. So what we try to do here is just to provide image guidance to the clinician, instead of using a robot, which there, there is a, a lot of research on to steer the needle automatically. Here, the surgeon is still inserting the needle, but the surgeon is provided with visual information as to when the needle should be rotated based on some mechanical models and path planning algorithms so that the needle tip reaches the target at the correct depth. So this is what we provided to augmented reality. And this is again, the same uh, setup. It's just the goal here is to uh, inform the surgeon about the necessary maneuvers to bring the needle towards in, his intended, intended target location by allowing the surgeon to know when the rotation of the needle should happen because the rotation is actually the steering action that you can perform. So this video shows how the setup works. Uh, again, the head of the clinician or the user is tracked. They can insert the needle manually here. It's inserted by robot, but it doesn't really matter. So as this needle is being inserted, the, the predicted path of the needle, if you rotated it now, and if you do not rotate it, are shown. So, and, and, the, and, the, and the desired path is also shown. And this is updated as the needle is being inserted. So by comparing these two, 
to the desired path, which is the straight line, you can decide when to rotate the needle and here. If the rotation happens at this depth, then it's guaranteed based on the models that the needle tip will reach the target. And this is the sort of situational awareness that's provided to the clinician thanks to these augmented real reality uh, setups and to the mechanical models. Here, the clinician chose not to rotate and went ahead, therefore it went into uh, error. The next <clears throat> task that I'd like to talk to you about is mandible reconstruction. Uh, so in patients with jaw cancer, the jaw is removed and then a part of the leg bone, the fibula has to be borrowed and cut at the correct location and with the correct angles to make a snug fit. So this is all done based on CT images, building a model, planning it. And, but then the problem is once you go into the operating room, if there is any change, then redoing these 3D printed surgical guides where the, where the saw has to be placed to make the cut is going to be very difficult. So what we try to do is to provide haptic virtual fixture or haptic guidance so that the surgeon's hand is moved to the correct cutting location. And also at the same time, the surgeon is able to see the cutting planes as floating in 3D and superimposed on the bone. So that's the goal of AI. So again, um, CT images, you build a model, the planning is done, and this plan is fed to both AR and virtual fixtures or haptics. So what you see on the left-hand side is without AR, it's just uh, the saw is connected to a robot. The robot knows the cutting plane locations, it's registered, and therefore the hand of the user is not to the correct location, and the user is unable to cut at the wrong location. What you see on the right hand side is that plus augmented reality. So um, the user is able to see, of, co of course, what you see here is TV display. It's, it's, the, it's the virtual reality, it's not the augmented reality that was hard to show. You have to see down that mirror to be able to see those planes as floating in the space. And then we compared what the effect of having haptic feedback, no haptic feedback and having augmented reality versus virtual reality would be in terms of the cut accuracy. And what we saw was that the best result was when there was obviously, when there was haptic feedback telling the surgeon's hand where, the, where to cut and augmented reality showing the surgeon where those cutting planes are. So that's where you get the best, best um, or smallest errors and sometimes even the quickest operation. So now I wanna, I'm done with that first part of providing intraoperative guidance to the surgeon so that they have this kind of x-ray vision and they are able to see deep inside the patient's body and move to the second application area, which is simulators for rehabilitation after injury or disability. So here we wanna harness the power of haptic and visual simulators to be able to create environments that uh, are for rehabilitation. So, Rehabilitation after disability, as you see on the top right, usually involves uh, performing a lot of repetitive exercises with the guidance of a therapist. But this is very burdensome and exhausting for therapists. Therefore, robots have been developed that have basically act as a haptic device plus a virtual game, virtual reality game for the patient. One problem is the disconnect between the motor space here and the visual space there for the user. So they have to look at the screen to be able to see the result of moving the robot. But for people who have had a disabling event and possibly have damaged brain function, it's going to be difficult to close that gap between what happens on the screen versus what happens uh, to the robot. So what we tried to do is to remove this disconnect, the disconnect between the coordinates frames of the patient's arm and that of whatever they see on the screen, the cursor, which causes a mental burden and may demotivate the patients from doing the task. So what we are trying to do here is co-locate the visual and motor spaces of the uh, patient so that hopefully the success rate of doing the task goes up because the task is just easier to do. The task is, happens at the place that you see it and act on it. 
So if you're able to make the task just a bit easier for a patient to do, then they are going to be motivated to do it. And once they do it, they're going to get better. And because they got better, they're going to do the task more and they're going to get better. And this positive feedback loop will reinforce their recovery. So it's a good thing. So uh, let's just start with the simple one. So this is a projection mapping setup from the top. There's a projector that projects a digital, digitally created game uh, on this uh, desk where the robot is sitting. And therefore you're able to interact with that environment, getting haptic feedback while looking at the environment in the same location. So an example in 2D again is pushing this car. So this is projection from the top and the user is able to feel that car as they push it and also see it without having to look at a different screen to know to see the result of their actions. So it's making things fun and easy so that patients are motivated to engage in these exercises and hopefully get better and come back and do these more of these exercises. So we compare the result of uh, providing haptic feedback versus no haptic feedback and providing this augmented reality versus virtual reality where there is a, a screen, a computer monitor you have to look at to see the, the, the car and the mouse basically, or the robot location. And also patients uh, who have a disability uh, often have some impaired cognitive function. So to simulate that for our healthy participants, what we did was that they were given a random number between 100 and 200, and they were asked to deduct three from that number and say it every two seconds. And so this created some cognitive load, uh, hoping that this would basically simulate what a person with disability is going through in terms of cognitive load. So here are the results. Really what I would like you to see is uh, the difference between conditions five and six. So when there is haptic feedback and there's cognitive load, AR performs significantly better than we are in terms of the task time. It was just easier to do the task. So this was good. How about 3D? So we went and applied the same projection mapping principles to 3D where there's this curved screen and you can create any 3D effect. So we created a number of tasks. <clears throat> now these tasks uh, I'll talk about very quickly. Uh, the first one is a snapping task. There's, there are 40 points in a space and you have to move from the current location to one location that's highlighted and not hit the other points. So this task is indicative or measures spatial awareness and accuracy. The second task was a ball catching task. Balls were rolled from the top down at random locations at with random speeds. And you had to bring this hoop under it to catch the ball. And the third one, and again, this one is indicative of spatial manipulation, reaction time, and speed. And the third task was a ball dropping task where you had to put this ball onto a hole that was at a random location uh, uh, on, the, on the floor. And this is a measure of precision and accuracy. So overall, if you look at the abilities required to perform these tasks, they have elements of activities of daily livings that people engage in. So these tasks really cover various things that we want to see. So this is a video. So this is the snapping task. Uh, you have to go and snap to different points in a space. <clears throat> the ball catching task. And of course the stereo video is turned off uh, so that we could get a video that was not blurred, but the person would basically wear glasses and would see things coming out in 3D. And if you hit the ball, if the ball hits that loop, you will get some haptic feedback in this case and the ball dropping task. So again, we looked at the effect of augmented reality uh, versus virtual reality and the effect of cognitive loading. And I'm not gonna go through all the results, Overall, we saw that co-location or this augmented reality produced better scores. So this is the score of winning the game. Each time you did the task correctly, you got a positive one. And, uh, and so this is the score. 
So overall, we saw that AR was better than VR. Last piece that I want to talk to you about is extension of this to uh, a simulator for rehabilitation and assessment of injured workers. So if a worker is injured in the performance of their work, they have to do functional capacity evaluation, which basically they are asked to do a number of tasks like lifting, pushing, pulling objects. And then a therapist fills out subjectively and based on observation, this sheet, giving them a score. So this is very qualitative and subjective. And of course, it also requires a large amount of equipment depending on the occupation of the injured worker. And also the workers are not too motivated or cooperative to perform these tasks. So what we tried to do is to use a robot, the same augmented reality display using projection mapping and a computer game engine for creating different games to create one unified immersive and omnipurpose task simulator for a lot of upper limb tasks. So this is less costly and also does not take all that space. So the robot simulate the physics of the task, the haptics of the task, and the augmented reality system creates the visualization of it. And then we, here we can collect numerical data, we can gamify the task, we can even mask certain task parameters from the user to see what the reaction of the user is, not knowing what they are doing exactly. And so here is one example. So the task here is painting the wall. So if, again, if uh, 3D is turned on, the user would see this roller at the tip of the handle and you would see the wall uh, that you are painting in 3D. And also you get haptic feedback. So the wall has infinite stiffness because of the robot. If you want to go inside, it'll push back on you. So this, without having any of the equipment, is simulating this task. So the question we had, I hope you see this at the bottom of the page, is do user biomechanics change? So does the user behave differently with the physical setup compared to the AR? Hopefully we want to see no difference, no significant difference. We, we couldn't say that there was no significant difference, but about 50% of cases, uh, and again, the analysis is very detailed, about 50% of the cases, we saw that the biomechanics were very similar between using the actual setup and using the augmented reality setup. So the augmented reality system did not significantly distort or change the way the human would perform the task. And this was a comparison between augmented reality setup with the robot and actually doing the task in, uh, with, with the physical equipment. So this is a good news. Now we have worked on um, kind of extending the set of tasks. So this is a different task. It's uh, you want to pour some coffee just to show that, you know, you could, you could simulate very different tasks uh, and uh, just, just have one uh, task simulator for a, a large number of tasks. So our next steps are really going uh, to different tasks and creating a library for different occupations. So uh, just to summarize, um, I talked about AR environments uh, to uh, create this image overlay to give uh, interoperative guidance to the clinician. Uh, also about what happens when you have augmented reality in addition to haptics or without haptics and the co-location of visual and motor spaces, especially for people with a disability uh, because they may have a hard time uh, connecting these two spaces together. So overall, AR has shown an improvement in terms of task performance versus VR. And in the future, what we wanna do is create just larger scale AR systems because some people with disability need to get into an exoskeleton and walk and can we create an uh, augmented reality environment for them as they walk in, in, a, in, a, in a big space. We have to uh, have enhanced occlusion mitigation, just increase the number of tasks that uh, uh, are uh, benefiting from augmented reality and also do more extensive trials, including patient trials where, where uh, it's uh, applicable. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just stop here and uh, if there is any time, I'll uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much. So, any question from the audience? In person? Online?
audience, do you have any question? You can unmute yourself and ask question if you want. I have a quick question about the haptic feedback on, on that uh, visual reality in the medical domain. Uh, what, what do you think the main challenges would be for making it a reality in practice? Um, so uh, are you asking about the rehab or about the... The surgical, sorry, yeah. So the, um, as far as the virtual reality itself is concerned, while well, we have a bunch of problems, you know, sorry. So um, sterilization, you have to keep the environment as sterile, right? So we are thinking that when you have virtual reality, it, it should be something that can be moved out of the way as necessary, uh, but also brought back into the operation. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I've understood your question correctly. Are you asking about the haptic feedback? Yes, I was asking if like, I mean, uh, again, first of all, thanks for a great talk. I was asking if that you can uh, in, uh, comment on the challenges of haptic feedback in augmented reality when it comes to like surgical uh, tasks that you mentioned. Like what are the bottlenecks for like bringing that into a larger scale? Uh... So the problems that you could have when you have haptic feedback is, first of all, you have to know where you want to provide your haptic feedback. So you have to have good registration, good models, really. So for instance, in the example of the orthopedic surgery for jaw, you have to really have exact models to know where the haptic feedback is going to be applied. You have to have a device for providing haptic feedback and that takes a space in the operating room, right? So that limits the motion of uh, where the patient is located, where the surgeon is standing, the movement of everyone ar uh, around the room. So that's another uh, challenge. Cost, you know, complexity, uh, safety, <laughs> all these are, uh, could be are, are actual challenges that have to be addressed. Thank you so much, Mahdi, for a great talk. Uh, once again, please join me thanking Dr. Tavakoli. Thank you so much.